Welcome back. Well, today I thought we would take a break from our post-holiday bargain shopping at Bedford Antiques and scoot on around the corner to the fancy schmancy antique store and see what they have going on there. So, when we come back... Well, this time around, I started off in the basement, and I have a lot of footage from the basement, but the basement area is the area in which they have their art and their used clothing. So, this is something I don't deal in, so I thought we'd save that for another time if you're interested, absolutely. But... While I was in the basement, I did happen to run into a couple of our viewers. And that's always really great for me, because you folks see me, but I never see you. So when I do get the chance, I really enjoy it. All right, um, let's start off with uh, a trip to that little mini booth. This is a china cabinet that's on the second floor landing. So let's take a look. So I'm sure you will remember this creative little booth, which is a china cabinet. Here, let me show you. It's on the landing between the second and third floors. I got some very cute little dishes in here last time. And I'm not going away empty handed this time either. This is a very pretty little German saucer, $4, nicely reticulated, that is going to go on a tidbit tray. Oh, yum. But let's take a look at this. $30, very pretty tea set. Um, let's see. Yep. Um... We have a Mark Mipoco and Mipoco is on one of our Japanese import company lists. Let's see if we can get in and take a look at that. Really very pretty. $30 retail, not a bad price. Not quite as good as my $4 plate, though. Now, that reticulated dish is really nice. And uh, I'm not concerned about drilling through the design that was right in the middle of it. Because, quite frankly, it was a rather pedestrian design. I think, as I recall, it was you know the usual 17th century comp couple frolicking in the woods. Um, pieces with designs like that are a dime a dozen. What I'm interested in is that beautiful little reticulated edge. So I'm not going to have a problem drilling into it. It's not a unique piece in any way, and it's not the kind of piece that has a design that would really make me say, ooh, don't want to drill into this. Um, when I got up the second half of the stairs, I immediately found a piece that grabbed my attention. So let's take a look at that booth. So we made it up to the third floor. And let me give you a bit of an overview before I get into too much. This is one of our first booths, and I've just barely begun. Butterfly salt and pepper shaker. It's all taped together, but I know the mark. It is $15, which ordinarily I would say is high, but there's nowhere to the gilding, 
And these little butterfly wings are in really good shape. No chips. It's got a caddy. Yes, I am taking this, even though, to be perfectly candid, I'm probably going to have to sell it at cost, because at $15, there's not a lot of profit room. But we've discussed this before. I don't have a problem with selling something at cost because it drives traffic through your shop. I do a lot of work with salt and pepper shakers, in particular, the Japanese sets. I can usually get them in the malls for well below the online prices. I don't know why that is. I think it may just be something about my area because pieces like this, especially lusterware pieces in caddies with really interesting designs, um, that set, butterflies are really popular. People do love them. And that was an especially nice set, you know, with the lusterware and the pastel wings and so on and so forth. And if I stocked my Etsy shop based on profitability alone. And by the way, that is something if you are reselling, absolutely you should be doing. So this is one of those do as I say, not as I do, because my shop has a different purpose. It's primarily, primarily a vehicle to offload the stuff I buy. Um, and I buy the stuff in order to show you what's out there. So I have a different focus. If I were just focused on selling the items that are high profit for me, my Etsy shop would be nothing but salt and pepper shakers and tidbit trays. That would be it. But the profit on things like salt and pepper sh shakers and tidbit trays are the things that enable me to subsidize the other pieces so that they can go out with free shipping and so on and so forth. So it makes sense for me. And although I would say it's always smart to look at the aggregate sales in your online shop, on your booth, etc., you do want to target the high profit items. That's just good business sense. Um, a little set like those butterflies in the caddy with the almost perfect gilding and the luster wear and la la la. Those are all the hot buttons for salt and pepper shakers. So when I see pieces like that selling on Etsy, they end up selling in the 30, 40, even $50 range because people like them. And when they go to auction, people will fight over them. Uh, I will not be putting anywhere near that kind of price tag on mine, but it will allow me to go out, buy a $10 set, throw it in my shop, make enough of a profit to help defray the expenses of another less profitable item and get my money back. So works for me. And I would also say that if you do happen to see salt and pepper shakers, just so you know what you're looking for, interesting designs. Number one, luster wear. Number two, the caddy. People like sets in caddies. I assume it's because of the ease and convenience of picking up both your salt and pepper, you know, with the little caddy and moving it around. I don't know. I have no idea what is so appealing, but I can tell you they are very appealing pieces. So I didn't get very far. In fact, I think it might have even been the same booth when I came across another kind of piece that we've seen before. So let's take a look. Barrister bookcase here. We have four different levels. And we've talked about this. They are joined together. These are all separate. So you can pull two out 
and keep it lower, you can add two more to raise it. Um, this is $1,195, but on the tag it says there is an additional set like this that will go with it for free. So the other set is apparently not in such good condition. You can see this is the original fumed oak finish, the quartered oak facing in the front. Two of these for $1,200. It may not sound like a bargain, but for people who want a barrister bookcase, oh yes, it is. These things sell for a fortune. Yes, barrister bookcases, they sell. I'm, they will sell anywhere, in any part of the country. A barrister bookcase will sell. Antique bookcases will sell. They are the first to get snapped up. Um, the bookcase that is behind me, I have literally had people walk into my house and make me offers for it. It's people like antique bookcases. I attribute that primarily to the fact that people who like antiques often work from home, have home offices, have libraries, studies, etc. Just seems to go hand in hand appreciation for books and appreciation for antiques. But who knows what it is. I could be dead wrong about that. That's just what I think, just my speculation. But what I can tell you is bookcases always sell. Um, so if you're into furniture, that's what to go for. Barrister bookcases sell better than any other kind. Now, you may have noticed that if you look at my bookcase here and you look at those barristers, they have the same kind of wood, oak, the same kind of stain, that fumed oak, and we've talked about that before. They don't do that, that sort of finish anymore because it's highly toxic and people died. Yeah, it's ammonia fumes, you know. Um, just imagine what OSHA would make uh, if a factory said, yeah, we're going to expose our employees to rooms filled with ammonia fumes. It's not even legal to do that anymore. So it's a special finish and it produces a, a sort of walnut color from an oak piece. And that was very popular at the turn of the century. Um, Barrister bookcases, yes, I know that price might have looked high, but I can absolutely assure you, no, no, that's probably actually low. Two pair um, for 600 each, assuming the less attractive set wasn't too bad. No, that's probably a bargain basement price. Uh, because, like I say, people love them. They go nuts for them. So that's something to keep an eye out for in your travels. Because people will come to your house and pick them up. They will pay you to put, on, put them on trucks and ship them out. So it's not even a question of, gee, my local community is not interested in this. You can put them online. Sell them to someone halfway across the country and they'll deal with the shipping hassles for you. So it's always good to keep that in mind. Um, the next thing I saw is something, and these are very widely available in some parts of the country, and uh, you don't even see hide nor hair of them in others. So let's take a look. Tucked off in the back here is a set of what are being called daybed rails for $30. We've got brass, we've got iron. It looks like this might be a newer piece antiqued to look old. 
and I'm not sure about this daybed rails thing. Looks like a set of headboard and footboard to a twin bed. $30, even for a new repro piece. Nice price. Yes, headboards and footboards, particularly if they are brass or brass and iron. As I mentioned while I was filming this, I suspect those were newer, but antiqued to look old. But still, at the price, it's quite a bargain. I'm, you know, I know most people do not have twin beds in their homes anymore. Usually that's just something for children. But still, you just can't find a headboard and footboard anywhere for $30. So, if you want to go out and get an inexpensive headboard footboard set for your kids, absolutely shop the antique stores. You will get something that is much more sturdy and reliable as opposed to new furniture, much less expensive. And when Junior, you know, moves off to college, you can throw it right back on the market again and probably sell it for a profit. But I thought that was something interesting to look at, mostly because it was hidden away. Um, next up. Uh, my attention was attracted by a little lamp in a corner. Okay. Nice little parchment shade. It's a clip-on. And uh, 30, no, it's $55. We've got a dog or a rabbit or something. Good heavens, I don't know what that creature is. I like the shade frankly. It's a nice vintage shade. The lamp is not doing that much for me. Well, the lamp itself was nothing that caught my attention. I couldn't even tell if that was a dog or a rabbit or, I mean, when I first saw it, I thought it was a Rolls Royce hood ornament. You know, it was the winged victory or something. I'm still not sure those, those were ears and not wings. But the shade was nice. And I thought the shade was something worth looking at. Those nice little parchment shades. Um, they're easy to repair and restore. Very pretty. And as you can see, they match very well with more modern lamps. So again, lesson to be learned here. If you see them, grab them. Um, oh, okay. Now, I, I was debating about whether or not I wanted to show you this bit of filming because the camera went nuts. I don't know why. I think it's be because I was behind this huge floor to ceiling window and it just, it wouldn't focus. The light wouldn't, um, the lighting wouldn't equalize, but Bear with me. I know it's not quality film footage, but I thought you might like to take a look at this piece anyway. So let's see if we can get the camera to focus in on this. All right. That seems to be a little better. Um, this piece is a Japanese reticulated plate, $10, we're looking at about eight inches, very nicely hand painted. Now you've got to know I'm thinking tidbit tray. Well, at $10, it's sort of the high side of what I'm willing to pay for a tidbit tray plate. However, I don't have a problem going that high for special plates because you build the tray around them. The plate, something like this, is what sells the tray. So I'm going to think about it, and I might come back. And by the way, I'm noticing that, the, here we go. When I get too close, the camera tries to compensate with the lighting. And sometimes it has trouble focusing in. 
So I think right about here, you could see the overall pattern without that weird light flicker. Now, I said I was going to think about it and I might go back for it. Not on this trip, but if it's still there at a later date, I might. And I thought that deserved a little bit of an explanation, a little bit beyond you know, what I mentioned in the filming. When I do tidbit trays, I usually design the tray around one, uh, sometimes more, of the, usually just one of the plates, and then I get more plates to complement that plate, or maybe I'll do it around a topper, uh, so there's some sort of consistency and theme to the tidbit tray. Now, a piece like that, that is this just this mass of flowers, is a good choice for something like that because the many colors in the flowers gives you a lot of options in terms of the colors of plates you can pair it with and also the kinds of little trinkets you can put on the top to make it more interesting. At $10, that is absolutely not very much above the thrift store prices. Um, some of you who watched The Crazy Lamp Lady may remember when I was complaining when we were at Community Aid about those Dolores Umbridge kitten plates. Honestly, it was just like a Harry Potter joke. Um, or you see these like so-called collector's plates, Norman Rockwell series or whatever. Ordinarily, in the thrift stores, those plates are going for five, six, seven dollars. They're not old. They're not valuable. They're, they're not even pretty. I mean, it is among the most pedestrian of, of art forms you can find out there. You know, a, a Bradford Exchange collector's plate. At ten dollars, uh, a reticulated, gilded, Japanese plate that's been hand painted back in the days when hand painting really meant some nice work. There's no comparison. And so I would have to say, yeah, thrift store prices because for ten dollars, you're getting ten times as much plate as you would get if you went and got one of those Dolores Umbridge kitten plates for five or six dollars at a thrift store. So that's one of the reasons that I think plate buying is something of an art. Okay, we have two more pieces, I think, and we'll finish this up. Uh, when I went around to the back, and this is the area where I had previously found some really interesting steampunk stuff, I found a great piece of furniture. It's the sort of thing that makes me wish I had access to the schoolhouse. You know, the contractors are still out there. By the way, they swept it up for me, which was really kind of them. I'm very impressed. I like this new contractor. Um, if I had the space to store this as a project piece, it would have come home with me, even if I had to carry it on my back on the bus. All right, here is another nice dresser. You notice that top drawer? Here, let's pull it out a little. There's the profile of the drawer, the nice curved line. And of course, you can see the top drawer overhangs the bottom. Don't need to tell you what era this comes from. Um, $189.98. That's what the price is. Now, somebody stripped this down, but did not put a finish on it. Uh, but keep in mind, when they strip it down like this, They've done 90% of your work for you because putting a finish on this piece is as easy as applying a coat of furniture polish. It really is. Given what this is, 
And we're looking at a 200-year-old piece of mostly refinished uh, furniture here. Wow, under $200, yeah, that's a good buy. Is that amazing? It was like $190. The piece is 200 years old, and somebody did all the work already. Now, pieces like that, now I, I do not know if that was mahogany or cherry, and in fact, it might have been a combination of both. They did that sort of thing. I, I think it was mahogany. Some woods need to be stained and varnished or, well, polyurethane, whatever you want to do. Not just left naked. Oak is wood. You can just leave naked. Um, it's It has a, a good hard wood texture. Holds up well. It ages nicely. So if you end up getting nicks and cracks and so on, it just adds to the piece. Other woods, uh, maple, for example, maple does not like to take a stain. Pine does not like to take a stain, not evenly anyway. Pine likes to be painted. Applewood, hard to get a stain on applewood. But mahogany and cherry, they need to be stained and varnished. So you find a piece like that, and this happens a lot. People will find a piece of furniture and say, oh, it's got a nasty old finish on it. I'm just going to strip it down to the bare wood and won't this be great? Back in the 60s and 70s, that happened all the time. And people would then be very surprised when they stripped all the finish off the piece and found several different kinds of wood. Or they would look at the piece and say, ooh, this is creepy. Well, there's a reason for it. Um, mahogany scratches up really easily and left to its own devices is not overwhelmingly attractive. But if you put on a stain, and years ago they used to French polish them, which is not really polish, it's like a, a very involved finishing technique. Beautiful, but involved. You can get the same general look by just throwing a coat of nice mahogany stain on it and varnishing it or polyurethaning it. That's what you need to do. That's what those pieces looked like originally. And although I have to say, uh, seeing an old oak piece that's been painted over does get on my nerves a lot more than something like this. This does get to me. It's like, goodness, at what point were they going to realize that there was a reason that piece of furniture was so heavily finished in the first place? Properly finished, a mahogany bureau like that is just staggering. They're just so beautiful. Naked like that, you kind of wonder what's wrong with it. So, a piece like that under $200, $10 worth of stain and varnish, and you have a piece, especially if you do it well, that will be worth five, dollars $600, no question about it. Uh, and I, I'm, this is one that, believe me, if I have the space to store it and to work on it, I would be willing to put my money where my mouth is because all I could think of when I saw that piece was, oh, if only I could take advantage of this bargain. All right, last piece up today is a, a, small, a smaller piece, and we'll talk about that after you get a chance to see it. Well, let's get in now and get that out of the way. Very pretty piece of English china. Nice. A lot of gilding. Beautifully executed. Eight dollars. I do not often find nice English pieces to offer in my shop. 
and I sure don't find them for $8. So this one is coming home with me. English China was a thing. Absolutely, they had pottery and china companies in England for a long time. They produced beautiful work, but we don't see it in my area. So I'm always glad when I have an opportunity to come across a piece like that. Now this one, $8, it has a tiny crack in it. And you know what that means? That means a China repair project. But it also means that when the repair project is complete, I have a piece I can throw into my Etsy shop and sell at a good price because of course it will be repaired. You know, you don't charge the same amount of money for a repair piece that you charge for a pristine piece, but it's still going to be very nice, very attractive. It's going to find itself a home. But I like being able to get my hands on pieces like that every once in a while, just to shake up the contents of the Etsy shop. And as I was saying before, when I was talking about things like the tidbit trays and the salt and pepper trays that have a higher profit margin, those are the things that allow me to go out, pay a little more for an English vase and sell it for a little less because, you know, it had a flaw. All right. I got plenty of footage at the fancy schmancy antique shop. So we're going to do some more of this. Meantime, you all have a great day and I will see you tomorrow. Thank mm -hmm. you.